The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. We are about to roll into what is arguably the greatest sports month of the year. We're into the teeth of football season. An incredible college game coming up tomorrow night between Georgia and Alabama with Alabama as an underdog at home. We got the Ravens playing the game of the week on Sunday night football, which you'll hear here. You got the Commanders, and everybody is all a flutter about Jaden Daniels, and they should be. And we're about to head into postseason baseball. We got hockey season starting in a couple of weeks. NBA training camps are opening up. You want sports? We got sports. It's like Golden Corral. You can all you can just graze the buffet and take what you want. Man, a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun when everything uh, comes together. Now. Uh, baseball isn't what baseball used to be in October. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, there's too much playoff baseball. It's much more of a crapshoot. I liked it better when they had uh, just, you know, one round of playoffs and then the World Series. Uh, that later went to two rounds. And now if you go all the way as a wild card, you're playing four rounds, which, you know, it's just randomness there. It's not you know, what the regular season is supposed to be all about. It's about getting through the grind and getting through other teams and merging on top. I I probably talked about this before, before the wild card. And it's, you know, the wild card made sense. Uh, Television rules sports, all sports. And uh, the more television product you have, the better off you are. But I just remember when I first came to New York in 1987 and uh, I had grown up here pretty much without baseball the senators left when i was 13 years old i really never adopted the orioles and washington although they kind of adopted the orioles in the 80s when they were good when they won the world series in 83 really wasn't our team and so when i got to new york you sensed the passion for people that loved the yankees and loved the mets and vice versa hated the other team and at the end of the season, the 87 season, these were the defending champion Mets, and they had Strawberry, and they had Gooden, and they had Wally Backman, and they had uh, Lenny Dykstra, and Davey Johnson was the manager. They, they owned New York at that time. And they played a late-season series against the Cardinals, which essentially determined the division title, and only the division title winner went on to the playoffs. And it was as intense as anything I can remember in regular season baseball. You don't have that anymore. I mean, uh, you know, we have the Yankees and the Orioles fighting for the division, but both teams are going to go into the playoffs, and there's a lot to be said for being a wild card over a division winner. Um, Not that it's bad for the Yankees to win the division, but uh, we saw what happened to the Orioles last year. They got 101 wins. They won the East. They sat around for a week and then got swept by the Rangers and hadn't been swept in a regular season series all year long. So we just don't know. Uh, but uh, we'll get to some more uh, on the playoffs and uh, and what, what's expected next week when we really get rolling into it. I just want to talk about what I did yesterday. And, uh, and I think it's going to be a preview of what I'm going to be doing in my golden years here. Um, I, I noted that the uh, Nationals had a 1 o'clock game yesterday against Kansas City. And they play some regular season games in the afternoon but if you don't wind up in the shade you can you know you can literally bake out there when it's 100 degrees and you know what the humidity is like in this town so i saw yesterday okay it's a late september game it shouldn't be too bad uh it was a little bit humid but we had no sun it was cloudy and i met a friend of mine out there he's pretty much in the same stage of life that i'm in we can both retire but kind of afraid to do that we don't really want to do that because we don't know what we're going to do with ourselves but he's got some flexibility in his job and i finish up here at 11 o'clock so it worked out perfectly i uh, went out to the uh to the stadium yesterday right after work took the metro or right here at the friendship heights uh stop so it's just really convenient and i was there before noon and i i got the tickets and i told him okay i'm going to be out in front of the the front gate and i waited around about 20 minutes for him to uh, to show up. And as I was standing there, I was watching all these people going in, and I thought, my God, this is one of the few places I can go to other than, like, visiting a nursing home where I'm the median age. 
you know, and uh, and I was thinking that there really should be some marketing, <clears throat> excuse me, some marketing for uh, people of my age and older that we have these afternoon games and maybe tie in some activity. I don't know, shuffleboard, just something that makes it more attractive for the senior citizens to show up. And uh, it was a uh, it was a game that the Nats lost again. Uh, they're they're you know they're not maybe not going to top. Last year's win total looked a few weeks ago like it was certain. They're going to need to sweep sweep the Phillies this weekend in order to do that, and uh, I don't think that's going to be likely, though the Phillies have clinched all they can clinch. They won't get 100 wins. They've clinched the division. Uh, I guess guess they could clinch the top record in the National League. They're tied with the Dodgers with 94 wins, so they, I guess, have something to play for here. But, uh, you know, it seemed like 71 wins was a certainty, and now they'll have to get a sweep uh, to get 72. So uh, we'll see if they can manage to pull that off. But um, as I was watching the game, I I was just thinking about uh, Patrick Corbin and making his last appearance here. And I'm one of those who says thank you to him. Um, he, He has not been good which is an understatement over the last five years, a really good column yesterday by Barry Zuluga pointing out he's been the worst starting pitcher in baseball for the last five years. Uh, and, and some of the numbers are mind blowing um, that what he, uh, what he did post 2019 when he was such a big factor in the Nats winning the World Series and was just incredible in Game 7 when he took the ball for three innings and he shut it down in time for Howie Kendrick to knock it off the foul pole for the game-winning home run. And uh, as Barry wrote yesterday, of the 173 pitchers who have thrown at least 300 innings over the past five seasons, no one has had a higher ERA than Corbin's 5-6-1. No one has given up more than Corbin's 899 hits or Corbin's 491 runs or Corbin's 131 homers. No one has allowed a opponents a higher batting average than Corbin's 296 or lost more decisions than Corbin's 70. In 38 of his 136 starts since 2020, he has allowed at least five earned runs, most in the game. Ouch. And uh, yesterday, I'm watching him get through the first inning and the first two batters of the second, and I say to my buddy Barry, hey, uh, wouldn't it be ironic if in his last game as a national, he pitches a no-hitter. Well, that was just stupid talk because uh, they gave up a run in the uh, in, in that second inning. And then Corbin did what Corbin does. He loaded the bases and gave up three more runs in the, uh, in the fourth inning, in the third inning. Uh, lasted until the, uh, the fifth, actually the sixth. Uh, one out in the sixth. He had thrown uh, 73 pitches, and Davey Martinez went out to get him. And he got what he deserved, which was a standing ovation. I don't care about those numbers over the last five years. World Series are hard to get. It had been 95 years since Washington had won a World Series, and he was a big part of it. So I stood up with the crowd of, what did they announce yesterday? They announced 14,300. I'm guessing there's some season tickets thrown in there. So look, maybe 10,000 there. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a good crowd. But uh, all those who were there stood up and applauded the, applauded Patrick Corbin and should have. And uh, this was Corbin speaking to reporters after after the game and the reception uh, that he got. This, this last six years have, have gone by fairly quick, uh, looking back now, but um, enjoyed every second of it. Don't, don't regret anything. Um, enjoyed my time um, here. And obviously to win a World Series, start a family, and... Um, get to meet all you guys so it, it was it was great um, really enjoyed it all and um, got to meet a lot of people and probably these next couple of days um, um, maybe say some goodbyes to, to, to people that I haven't really got to talk to as much but um, but yeah I wouldn't like I said wouldn't take anything back it's been great um, learned a lot um, highs and lows but but loved every second of it yeah that I mean that was cool um, Kind of maybe thought something Davey might come out um, in that situation there, but um, yeah, I think that might might be my first one of those. But it was uh, it was cool. I mean, it's um, half my my career I've been here. Um, got to um, experience a lot with the fans, and um, they've supported us throughout the years that I've been here. So um, nothing but love towards them, and um, that was uh, really special. What goes through your mind when you're 
walking off the field, you actually you tip your cap and you have the ovations that you have. What goes um, through your mind? Yeah, I mean, just obviously uh, the fans standing up there was, was pretty special, but just kind of looking back towards uh, the, the, the seasons that I've had here and, um, and everything that we've gone to, just like I said, really have enjoyed it. And um, thank you to the fans for, for doing that. Um, that was special, something I'll always remember. Yeah, and I hope that uh, he leaves here with, with good feelings, even though the last five years were what they were. And again, uh, just like Strasburg getting that extension, $240 million in hindsight looks like a disaster, but it was the right thing to do at the time. And we'll always remember that these two guys who basically were either terrible in the case of, of Corbin or not available in the case of Strasburg, they gave us something that is so hard to get. The Cubs went 108 years without winning one. The Red Sox went 86 years without winning one. And those guys delivered. Uh, the other thing about Corbin, and although the numbers are not good, he was always available. And there's a lot to be said when you look at the injured list week after week in baseball, and especially pitchers. I mean, one pitcher after another blowing at his arm for and going under Tommy John surgery. Patrick Corbin, in the six years he was with the Nationals, never missed a start never missed a bullpen session, was always available. You, you try to prepare. Um, you, you come up with a routine and try to be as consistent with that routine. Uh, there's a lot of ups and downs in baseball, and, and you, you try to learn from those. And um, you want to be accountable and, and, and take the ball, and um, and that's our job. And um, try to go out there, lead by example, um, be a good teammate, and things like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, professional. He was totally professional, uh, and he—he, he, I think he's going to catch on with somebody next year. He's not going to get this kind of money someplace else, and I don't think he's going to come back here at a discount, but I think he's still got something left. He's shown flashes from time to time, and, um, you know, the team was, what, 11-21 uh, and 21 in his starts this year, but not all those losses uh, were his fault, and his ERA – Unfortunately, was pretty much in line uh, with what he did over the last five years. His, his ERA winds up this year at 5.62. Also yesterday, the A's played their last game in Oakland. And uh, it was nice that they won. They sold out the place. But I can really relate to what they are feeling. Uh, their owner, John Fisher, uh, much like Bob Short, a, a complete carpet-bagging jerk, who, uh, you know, is, is chasing the money in Vegas. And these other owners, just like they approved the sale of the, 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 uh, the move, not the sale, but the move of the senators from here to Arlington, Texas in 1972, uh, these owners have approved what is an absolute embarrassment for baseball. The, the A's are going to play the next three years in a minor league park in Sacramento. That's disgusting. And, yeah, they're supposed to get a new stadium built for them in Vegas, but who knows if that's going to take three years or more. And it didn't have to happen. Uh, You know, he should have done the right thing for the fan base, and that is to sell the team. And, you know, when Dan Snyder was out, he and his wife released a statement which, uh, you know, said they were proud of their stewardship here. Give me a break. They, they destroyed the team here. And fortunately, there were owners here, local guys, Josh Harris and Mitch Rails, who understood the word stewardship and understood that a team is a public trust and what it means to the community. And it's not just a way to fill your pockets with cities building you stadiums. OK, he said to Oakland, build me a stadium. Taxpayers didn't want to do it. Fine. So he left. I, you know, this is this is not the right thing and boy what a transformation Oakland has undergone in the last five years in 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 that period of time they lose it all they lose the Raiders to Vegas they lose the Warriors to San Francisco and while you might say well that's a reasonable trip for fans to take it's not the same thing it's not the same thing as going to a game in Oakland where they had been for for many years and had won championships the first one being 1975 when they swept the bullets and then now you lose your baseball team too a baseball team that had been there since 1968 and a team that had been in the 1970s 
the toast of baseball. They won three straight World Series. They were competitive every decade. They were competitive not that long ago, maybe a few years ago. But the problem is stadiums and money and luxury suites and tax breaks. And so so he he got what he wanted from Vegas, but he's got to wait three years for it. He's got to park this team in a minor league stadium for three years. This was Scott Van Pelt last night on his show on ESPN. Other cities have lost teams, and it's gutting. To lose three is without precedent. You think Vegas is going to support the aid? Come on. The passionate, emotional goodbyes from those who love the team are to be expected. But ask yourself this. Have you heard even a single dissenting voice outside of Oakland? Anyone saying, oh, this is a great idea. You got it all wrong. This Sean Fisher guy, you got it wrong. He's a great guy. I haven't. This right here, this is just the worst of what sports can be. Heart goes out to you, A's fans. Yeah, well said. Worst of what sports can be. And if you want to get a real feel for what A's fans are feeling, uh, this fan wasn't identified. But uh, they were doing a lot of interviews with fans yesterday, uh, the local TV stations in uh, in the Bay Area, uh, talking to them. And I think this this guy was not identified, but he really articulated it uh, as well as anyone. My dad didn't know what to do with me, so he brought me here. And we used to walk across that bar bridge to games, and it was like magic. And I watched Wayne Murphy and Ricky Henderson out there running the outfield, stealing bases, hat flying off. It was beautiful, and that's what made me fall in love with baseball. And then I had a little brother who was 13 years younger than me, and I didn't know what to do with him. So what did I do? I brought him here. I brought him to baseball games. I brought him to opening day. His birthday's in April, and we would come to opening day every year. And when I went away to college, I would send him tickets to opening day every year, and he would call me for the national anthem, and he would call me for the seventh inning stretch, and he would call me for Jason Giambi's first at bat as a Yankee so I could hear the boos. And then when I had kids, I knew what to do with them. And so what did I do? I brought them here. My kids are so at home here. They come in here and they take off their jackets and they drop them in a corner and they run off because they feel like they're at home. Not like they're in a place of 20,000 strangers or 4,000 strangers. And so that's what baseball in Oakland is. This is generations. This is like father to son to brother to child. And you're ripping that away for what? You're trying to fill a stadium with 70% visiting fans? That's ridiculous. Baby Gap, Nepo Baby, guy who inherited everything. We work for ours. That's what we do in Oakland. We work. Everything that we have, we work for. This is blue collar. This is who we are, and we want this team to stay. You know, filling the stadium with 70% visiting fans. Where have we seen that before? Uh, At least you could say for Schneider, he wasn't a Nepo Baby but uh, fortunately, he sold the team. Uh, I don't think he was ever going to move them, but uh, he's gone, and we now have new ownership. As for the baseball side of it, uh, you may not be old enough to relate like I am, but, uh, yeah, the, the feeling of, of losing that baseball team in 1971. I'll tell you something else about yesterday's departure. Uh, I was not there for the last game at RFK that the Senators played in 1971, but uh, you've probably heard that uh, the game was never completed because the fans stormed out on the field with two outs in the ninth, ripped up dirt, and they just called it a forfeit and gave the game to the Yankees, even though the Senators were ahead thanks to a Frank Howard home run. Uh, They had uh, 200 police officers there to make sure that didn't happen yesterday, and it didn't. It was a love-in. Those fans appreciated what that ball team did for the community for all those years. For 56 years, they had a baseball team there, and they may never get one again. And uh, they don't have any teams whatsoever. They don't have any teams left in Oakland with the incredible history of, of all three of them, with the Warriors, the Raiders, and now the A's all gone. And that fan articulated the, the, the gut-wrenching part of it as well as anyone we got a team back took us 34 years uh i was thrilled to be able to go back to rfk with my dad and my son and the generations to generations that he talked about uh, applied to me but when those those senators left in in 71 uh, ending a run of baseball in washington for over 70 years uh, i think we had baseball first at, at the turn of the century and uh, and we did not get it back until the turn of the next century. 
and uh, the feel is is devastating, and I and I feel for those fans in Oakland. All right, uh, coming up, uh, I, I I like to listen to smart people talk, and a conversation yesterday between Wright Thompson, who is the best there is at uh, sports features profiles. He's written a book about Emmett Till called The Barn. And he was on the Dan Patrick show to promote that. But what they got into was Muhammad Ali. And I'm going to play uh, part of that conversation about Ali and their interactions, both of them, with him. And I'll add my own two cents to that as well. Uh, We got Ravens preview coming up at 1030 as we'll talk to Jonas Schaefer from the Baltimore Banner. Ravens with a huge game on Sunday night against the Buffalo Bills. Preview of that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. Uh, Ravens preview coming up at 1030. Bram Weinstein at 11 o'clock. He'll be calling Sunday's game as the uh, commanders go for three and one. Three and one, huh? Yeah, not too bad. All right. Um, so yesterday, uh, Wright Thompson, who I think is a, a brilliant writer, and not all writers are articulate about their work. And when he goes on various shows, he's really good about promoting what he does. He's very articulate about that and very moving what he says. He has this incredible deep voice. Uh, he's a relatively young guy. He's, I don't think he's 50 yet, uh, but he has done – some incredible profiles of athletes. He uh, did one recently of Caitlin Clark. He did one on Joe Montana. They call these takeout pieces. You know, they're they're a lot longer than the average article that you might read online. Uh, and they go into a, a deep dive on the person's life and career and things like that. So um, he, he was on uh, the Patrick Show to talk about his new book called The Barn. And it's it's all about the horrific murder of Emmett Till, which is really a touchstone of the civil rights movement, but it's an unknown part of the story. And from what I gather, the barn is where the actual murder took place. And uh, there was a really a a terrific movie that was out like two years ago uh, called Till. And the scene where Emmett Till's mother Uh, demands to see his mutilated body and the emotion that she shows in this scene in looking at her child who was tortured and beaten for no reason by racists who, and and, I mean, if you want to learn about the civil rights movement, you you probably start with this because um, not only were the murderers acquitted of this, but because of you can't have double jeopardy in this country, they told their story to Look Magazine and told what actually happened, even though they were acquitted of doing that in court. It's just uh, it's just an unbelievable moment in our history. But uh, that's not really what this really uh, segued into. Uh, they got to talking about the profiles that Wright Thompson has done. And Thompson turned the tables and said, well, you know, who was the most important athlete or most significant athlete that you ever interviewed? Dan Patrick's been doing this for 40 years. And I would have said this as well. I never really interviewed him, but I was around him. It was Muhammad Ali. I mean, I, I, Muhammad Ali, in my mind, is the most consequential athlete of the 20th century. I don't think there's any question about that. The time and place and uh, his eloquence, his courage, all those things – at a time when the heavyweight champion of the world really meant something. And post-boxing career, he became sort of a, um, a character of, of more than mythical proportions. I mean, it, it, he, he could walk into a room and the room would take on a whole different feel once he came into it. So uh, I, I pulled this about two and a half minutes and I'm going to add something to it because Wright Thompson was actually in the same room I was in with Muhammad Ali almost 25 years ago. And uh, so this is this is Patrick describing his interaction with Muhammad Ali. And then Wright Thompson, who's eh, significantly younger uh, with his memories as well. So I met him at the ESPYs and talked to him and his wife. I was there when he checked in the hospital for Parkinson's. I was covering that. They had fight night in Arizona and I was the host and I presented him with a a ring that they were giving to him. 
And I was there in Atlantic City for a Mike Tyson fight when Ali came in, and it was Ali Boumaye, and the yeah. entire the entire it's one of the greatest moments. I'm getting goosebumps wow. thinking about it. Just he came, on my arm. he came in, and everybody realized it was Ali. Everybody in the building started chanting this, and oh. I was sitting with Danny Aiello and Matt Dillon, the actors. And I, I remember turning to Danny Aiello and I said, we'll never experience something like this again. And he couldn't even speak. He was like, like you were frozen, dumbfounded, because you really realized what somebody meant to so many people anywhere in the world. And here he is in Atlantic City walking in. And I just remember, you know, so many things flashed before you. But to be there outside of the hospital and he's in there. And uh, you know, just diagnosed with Parkinson's. So, uh, and I'd just been around Howard Cosell too, who had Parkinson's. I actually had to pour his water for him because he couldn't hit the glass. Uh, wow. It was terrible. So, you know, the, the intersection. I've been very lucky over forty years to have quite a few of those. But I think Ali's impact on me because of the impact he had on others. I uh, I walked into the media room at the Atlanta Super Bowl. Uh, you know, they had that sort of big lounge and then the area where all the computers were and then Radio Row was on the other side of that. That would have been like 2000, 99, 2000. It was the Rams Titans. Okay. And uh, Tyson was fighting on TV and there was a huge big screen TV and like really leather couches sitting around. And I walked into that press room and uh, it was Muhammad Ali sitting by himself watching a Mike Tyson fight. And I just like, I can't go bother this. Like yeah. and no one would go bother him. I mean, there, yeah. it was very much like an incredible sign of respect. Yes, there was that respect there. But let me add to that because I was in that room as well. This was the day before the Super Bowl. And he's correct about that. It was the Titans and the Rams. And that was the Kurt Warner first Super Bowl and Dick Vermeil. And uh, it was it was all very exciting. But this was this was the day before it was Saturday. Uh, Mike Tyson had a fight in London, so the time difference made it like a 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock fight uh, in in Atlanta time. And he, he's correct. He wanted to watch the fight. Ali comes into the lobby with, of course, an entourage. He's got people around him uh, and, and security. And it's like he's not walking. He's floating. And he begins to walk towards the press room because that's where you have this big screen TV. They didn't even have HD in those days. It was just one of those, you know, big screens like, you know, 48 inches or whatever. And, uh, and so like the C parts as he walks through the lobby, but as he walks, people begin to follow, including some very, very well-known media people. Now, you know, Wright Thompson was not very well known at that time, but I walk next to Andy Rooney. Of, of CBS, 60 Minutes. Andy Rooney used to get the press pass for CBS every year and show up at the Super Bowl. He was a big Giant fan, so when the Giants were in, he was really all in on that. But, uh, yeah, he would use that and uh, and sit in the press area and, and watch the game. So uh, I, I walk in with, with him, and there are others in there, and Ali sits down right in front of the TV. He's got people with him, and uh, I, I'm standing next to Andy Rooney. And Andy Rooney says to me, he goes, well, why are these people so enamored with him? And I said, well, that's Muhammad Ali. And he said, well, you haven't answered my question. <laughs> so I don't know if he quite got it, but anyone who had experienced Ali growing up like I did, and Andy Rooney should have, uh, should have understood this. Now, Wright Thompson is not 100% correct in saying that everybody left him alone. There were two people that went up to talk to Muhammad Ali, sitting on like it was um, it was like an ottoman that he was sitting on. And there was enough room on one side for another person to sit down. One of them was Jerry Eisenberg, who is still writing sports, lives in Las Vegas now. He's in his mid-90s, might be 94, 95 years old. So we're going back now, you know, 20, almost 25 years to 2000. And Ali definitely knew who he was, definitely talked to him. And the other one was John Saraceno, 
And John Saracino covered boxing for a long, long time. He did it for ESPN, and he did it for USA Today. And Ali clearly knew him. Those were the two people who talked to him, and they absolutely did. But in in this crowd of people uh, were some of the most accomplished people who ever covered sports in 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 their lives. I mean, you, you, if you looked around that room, not just Andy Rooney, there was there were some who's who's there. And all of them looking on at Ali in awe of Ali watching TV. And I don't think, I don't know if we'll ever have an athlete of that kind of magnitude that will come along again. You know, Michael Jordan carries a great deal of weight as the greatest basketball player who ever lived. But culturally, he doesn't really hold a candle to Muhammad Ali. And uh, and so when you when you talk about him and you are the age of – Dan Patrick, who's about my age, Wright Thompson, a little bit younger. Uh, you you got to have a really good understanding of uh, of what he meant uh, to people growing up in, in the 1960s and 1970s, as I did. Flawed. He was flawed, absolutely. And he was very cruel to Joe Frazier. He painted Joe Frazier uh, as a, he, he called him an ape, which was which was just horrible. And Uncle Tom, things like that. There, there, there are things about Ali that are not admirable. But if you take his life in its totality, it's unbelievable. And here you have two of the greatest at what they do, Dan Patrick and Wright Thompson, talking about Ali in a way that is just so instructive and, and so um, make, makes you think. And I think that's, that's really uh, what smart people do. And uh, I, just, I just really enjoyed uh, that part of the conversation. So that was yesterday on the Dan Patrick Show. Uh, last night, uh, watched the first half. Um, <laughs> Cow- Cowboys win again. You know, Dak beats Daniel Jones. It's like uh, death and taxes. Uh, they, the, the poor old Giants who scored three touchdowns and gave up nothing but field goals to Washington lost. Last night, they kicked nothing but field goals, and they lost again to the Cowboys who got a couple of touchdown passes from uh, from Dak Prescott. They lose the game 20 to 15. Um, I have friends who are, I think, more critical of Al Michaels than I am. But, you know, Al is Al's pushing 80 now. And as good as he has been throughout his career, and he has been one of the top sports broadcasters for over 40 years, maybe even close to 50 years. I think he started doing uh, minor league baseball in the early 70s. And uh, he has been the voice of night football forever. You know, Monday night football, Sunday night football, now Thursday night football. But you just can't beat Father Time. I mean, the energy gets sapped from you, and it's a low-energy broadcast. And he works with Kirk Herbstreet, who's not a real excitable type. You know, Kirk is very analytical. So it's, a, it's not a very exciting team there. And you had a pretty good game last night. And, uh, and they never really brought it. And Al is now getting to that age. Well, he's been at this age, but really you see people that I'm, I'm, want, I'm getting close to it, an age where you sit around and you kvetch a lot. You complain. So uh, there's a lot of flags that are being thrown in the first half. In the first half of the game, they had 12 penalties that were called. And this is Al, who's had enough. Two-minute warning. Has not occurred. We got another flag. It's like June 14th here. Otherwise known as Flag Day, as you know. Clay Martin looks like a referee at a central casting. Well, yeah, he does like to have himself on camera a lot. He's in pretty good shape, I must say that. Uh, but, yeah, it, it did drag. But, you know, your job as the play-by-play guy, they're paying you a lot of money. I think he's getting like a million dollars a game. Yeah, you got to sell the product a little bit better than that. You got to keep people interested. Uh, but he he let it be known that he was not happy. And then as, as they got closer to halftime, Kevon Thibodeau jumped offside on a third and 12. And Al goes, oh, I got another flag. Got two more flags in the backfield. No more laundry left. And any number of calls coming your way. Uh, then then uh, there was a, a, a call on the field that there were fouls on, on both teams. Uh, on the play, and Al goes, oh, I'll bet. Well, maybe he did bet. You know, maybe he was betting on the Giants. Who knows? Uh, then when the Cowboys were whistled for a false start before a punt with 14 seconds left in the half, Herb Street asked if that foul was the eighth on the half of on Dallas, and Al goes, no, it's the 147th. 
Yeah, and I saw that too. You know, so uh, that's the game. You gotta, you gotta, gotta fold it into the game. Don't, don't whine about it. You know, explain maybe that these these penalties are a little bit excessive. What's going on there? So, you know, I think Al has had a wonderful career, and I think that it's just like anybody else in any other field. You don't want to stay past your welcome, and he's sort of reached that point. He's reached that point now. I saw an interview with him recently where he, uh, he said that he was friends with Vin Scully. Uh, we both played at Bel Air, kind of a humble flex there, or less than humble flex. And he said, Vin Scully said to him, you know, you ought to keep doing it as long as you still enjoy it. Well, who wouldn't enjoy doing 17 football games, staying in four-star hotels, going on private flights, you know, doing it? It's, it's a great life. But I think you've got to have some recognition that you just aren't bringing it anymore. And Vin Scully, one in a million, he retired at the age of 88 and still had his fastball. But baseball's different. Baseball's a different pace. And Vin could do what few others could do and was given the liberty to do it because he was Vin Scully as he could weave in these stories and keep you captivated with that. Football doesn't work that way. And as good as Al was, and Al in his day may have been the best to ever do it. Time to go, bud. I I know, I know it's tough to walk away. I know it's been a great life. I know you still enjoy it, but you got to bring more energy than that. And fetching about flags to me just doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it. All right. Coming up in the next hour, Ravens preview will be joined by Jonas Schaefer, who covers the team for the Baltimore Banner. Also, some comments from Arizona as the Commanders get ready to play on Sunday. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. So, we got the Baltimore Ravens. I don't think it's a must to win, but it's a game that they would really like to win, and a game that's at home, and a game where if they blow another 10 point fourth quarter lead, might be close to panic time. Uh, but they are saying all the right things. Uh, they are really optimistic after beating the Cowboys on the road. Cowboys rebounded last night. Uh, we will talk to Jonas Schaefer of the Baltimore Banner at 1030 about this game, which we'll hear right here on ESPN 630. Um, commanders have been in uh, Arizona all week, and uh, I think this, this makes sense. It also tells you uh, how much money is in the NFL. Just think about this. Um, they are spending with about 100 people. When you, t- you think of support staff and, uh, and all the players that are there, uh, it's, it's 100 people spending an extra four days in probably top, top hotel, you know, four-star hotel, the meals. Uh, they had to take all the equipment from Cincinnati out to Arizona. Uh, just just the, the, the amount of, of stuff that's involved in, in having a team stay out there. And, you know, you can just imagine what it is. It might be sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. Nobody blinks. Nobody blinks anymore. And it, it, it makes sense in that, you know, you have the whole week now to adjust to the time change. It cuts down on trips because you didn't fly back from Cincinnati and then have to fly out again to Arizona. So it cuts down on, on one trip there. And, uh, you know, we'll see if it pays off. It, 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 it didn't make sense to me when the schedule came out that y- you're playing a road game on a Monday night and then you have to play another road game just six days later and it's another time change. I think Cincinnati's Eastern time, if I'm not mistaken, even though it's Ohio. I think it's, I think it's Eastern. So, you know, the three-hour time change, it's just, just crazy. Uh, but that's, that's how the NFL worked it out. And the NFL, by the way, is, is going more and more on this short week stuff. It used to be that you'd hear the players complain a lot, and they, they realize it's not going to do them any good. And, and every time they complain, they say, here, here's more money. Shut up. Um, but you used to hear the players saying this is harder on our bodies playing these Thursday night games. Well, this year we got two Wednesday games on Christmas because the NFL can make another $100 million with Netflix. And so uh, the, these players are going to have to play on a Wednesday, but they say, oh, don't worry about it because we scheduled you on a Saturday the game before. So you got the extra day. Well, you also have given me a shortened week from the week before. So you're really playing like two shortened weeks in a row. Again, the money train keeps rolling. They want the money. They want the cash. 
Uh, as far as uh, where this football team is now, it's in a better place than I can remember. It's been it's been years. I mean, since the optimism around this team is probably as high as it's been since Joe Gibbs came back. I don't think that's an overstatement. I really don't. Um, because remember, this was pretty early in, in the Dan Snyder ownership when he hired Joe Gibbs. So he had inherited Norv Turner. He said, you know, not knowing much about football, you know, we're going to win right away, blah, 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 blah. And he said, okay, if, if Norv wins the division or if Norv makes the playoffs, might have been division playoff, whatever it was, uh, he gets to stay another year. So uh, the first year, they had been set up very well. Charlie Casserly had had fleeced the New Orleans Saints. They wanted Ricky Williams, and Mike Ditka was was a showman, and they wanted the publicity. And you remember that Mike Ditka was on the cover of ESPN, the magazine, with Ricky Williams in a wedding dress. That's how crazy things were. So they traded the whole draft here. The team was in, in pretty good shape, and uh, he had he had his quarterback in Brad Johnson. Charlie Casserly had done a lot of good things to set this team up, so Snyder couldn't screw it up. And sure enough, they made the playoffs, so he kept Noor for another year and then went for it in 2000. And because of his own stupidity, uh, Danny playing fantasy football, he winds up with a team that finishes 8-8. Eight and eight. Norv gets fired with the team still in contention at 7-6. and six. They play two crapola games against the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Dallas Cowboys, and they wind up 8-8. Uh, eight and eight. The Fortune 500 Redskins cost a fortune, finish 500. And now we move ahead. He's got Steve. Well, first he hires um, – he hires Marty Schottenheimer because everybody said, oh, you got to hire Marty Schottenheimer. And he, he, Marty first went on TV on ESPN working for it at the time. Oh, I can never work for an owner like Dan Snyder. Oh, $4 million a year for, for four years? Oh, okay, I'll work for Dan Snyder. And that was a lot of money in, the, in those days. And uh, he lasted one year. It was he, he, he did an incredible job with that team. And had he stayed, they'd have, they'd have been a good team. But, you know, Snyder didn't want him to have all the control and he wasn't having any fun, so he hired Marty. He brings in Steve Spurrier. Spurrier wins 12 games over two years, and he decides to quit from the golf course, and Joe Gibbs comes back, and people are over the moon. They lined the driveway into Redskin Park just to see his limousine pull up. I mean, it was, it was, it was high times. And unfortunately, he brought his 80s offense. They weren't very good the first year. Second year, though, they made the playoffs, and uh, and people were excited about the future. And then you started to see that, you know, he was not really the same Joe Gibbs as he was the first time around. They kept Vinny Serrato around. Uh, it was, I, I believe, that there was a lot of um, money going to the race team uh, that that really influenced the decision, and he was still concentrating on that. So we didn't get the same Joe Gibbs that we got the first time. This time, new ownership – a real front office, and a quarterback who looks like the real thing. And the early worries about, oh, he's not finding Terry McLaurin, that was put to bed on uh, on Monday night. And so yesterday was coordinator day. Uh, the way it works in the NFL, the coordinators speak only once a week. So the only time they're available is on Thursdays. So yesterday we got both Cliff Kingsbury and Joe Witt. And uh, this was Kingsbury because, again, he hadn't commented on this since the game. Uh, the call on that touchdown pass to Terry McLaurin, which is a, was a thing of beauty, uh, put in exactly the right spot. It, it could not be intercepted where he put it. Uh, Jaden Daniels knew he was going to take a hit on the throw, and he stood in there and he took it and he delivered it just where it needed to be. And McLaurin, as he has throughout his career in contested catches, made a great play on the ball and made the catch. Here's the thing. And not every offensive coordinator would have the ego to be able to do this. But uh, Kingsbury basically said, if, you know, for all the stuff that goes into plays, they study the tape, they look at the tendencies, they have the analytics. It's it's really – they don't have dirt there in Cincinnati. I guess it's an artificial turf field. But it's a play just like you and I drew up when we were playing football in the backyard. This is a play, as he admitted – this was yesterday from Kingsbury – that – was pretty much drawn up by the players. Really, think players, not plays. Like That's all that was. We basically invented a play because Terry said, I got him. And then you could see the confusion. I screwed up the play call because I was trying to kind of flip things and make it, and they just made it work. And so it's like 
in that situation, I learned a long time ago, you think players, not plays, and um, those two guys made a hell of a play. That was like the anti-Rick Pitino answer. Like, if somebody makes a great play, oh, yeah, we, we practiced that many times, you know, even though it was a, like a bizarre play bounced off of somebody's head. Oh, yeah, we work on that all the time. So that was that was really something, and, and good for Cliff Kingsbury for saying that. And and right now, that's the play of the year for the team. That That is the absolute play. It, it salted away that game on Monday night. Uh, more from Kingsbury, and this is, you know, you look around the league – Patrick Mahomes, through three games, has thrown four interceptions. Jaden Daniels, no turnovers through three games. Here's Kingsbury. He, he just sees the field. He, he um, is a quick processor, you know, good decision maker, obviously. And he knows when the party's over. He knows when to throw it away or when to scramble and um, not force it in harm's way. And uh, We're not built right now to overcome a lot of turnovers, and, and he knows that. And so we're trying to stay on schedule, be efficient, um, stay ahead of the chains, and he's really done a nice job so far of doing that. Knowing when to hold him, no when to fold him. So he's, he's been very good at that. Uh, Joe Witt talking. Now, th- as good as the offense has been, the defense is really bad right now. It, it's really bad. And one of the things that bothers me a little bit about Joe Witt is that every time he's asked about the secondary, he says, well, we're, we're still trying to figure out which guys fit where. And uh, I don't think at this point you should sort of be having open tryouts as to who is going to be in your secondary. And he talks about playing different guys against different teams I I never coached, so I don't I don't know. Maybe this is this is par for the course. I don't know, but he, you've had these guys together since the start of off season workouts. Free agency uh, pretty much wrapped up in March. The draft was in April. You went through the off season. You went through the mini camp. You went through a long training camp, and now you're, you're still trying to figure out who your secondary players are. And the reason is the secondary stinks. The secondary is terrible. They've given up play after play after play, and uh, yesterday Joe Witt addressed that. We all need to improve on making sure that um, we control the vertical throws, okay, um, that when we give looks to own and, and understanding where we want to send the ball, uh, if we're outside leverage, be that leverage, we're inside, you know, just play the defense that's being ran. And at the same time, and I'm not talking about Forbes, all right, when it's an opportunity to go make a play, go make the play. You know, let's not see it and understand it and can talk it in the meeting room. Let's go make the play when we see it. And so that's what we all need to do. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty simple, it seems like. Uh, he mentioned uh, Manuel Forbes, who missed the last game after uh, thumb surgery, and he's questionable to play on Sunday. And they, they don't really have an answer there. And, you know, the way the NFL works these days with the trade deadline, I wonder if, if this team continues to win, if they start shopping for secondary guys. Um, they, we see more and more trades – in recent years than we've ever seen before. And part of it is the length of the season. They've also moved up the deadline a little bit, which I think was a good idea. And it's, it's starting to look like baseball in some regards. So, you know, I know it's football's a little bit different because you have to work guys into your system. But I I think, you know, the way Noah Brown has, has slipped right in, he missed the first game because he didn't know the system as well. Last two games, he's played really well. So, they're weak there. They're very weak in the secondary. I think the linebackers are okay. The defensive front and, you know, th- what, what, they're, what they're apparently doing is they're, they're tying up the defensive front because they know that the secondary is, isn't good enough right now. You know, those kind of things go hand in hand. And that's, that's a real problem for them uh, at this point. The other thing, uh, identity. And this was uh, Witt yesterday asked about the identity of his defense. Not the identity that we want to be. You know, we haven't played the the brand of football that I was hoping for up until this point. And like I said, that's that's on me. Um, we want to be a, a team that produces the ball. We haven't. Um, now the hitting, I think we're hitting the way that we want to. But you know, we talk about um, energy. <laughs> there goes the phone again. Uh, energy um, um, creating ball, and we're not we're not necessarily doing that all the way. So this is not the style that that I envision right now. But we're trending that way. Uh, what does that mean? We're trending that way. No, you're, you're trending in a direction which is, is not very encouraging right now, and it's, it's being masked by an offense which has been tremendous. I mean, there's, if you score on every drive in a game, which is what they've done, they've gone two straight games scoring in every drive, you ought to win convincingly. 
you're winning time of possession, and here you are, you know, with 38 points, you ought to be cruising. And the fact that you gave up 33 tells you that that defense isn't very good right now. And uh, I, I don't know how much you watched of Kyler Murray this year, but he has been terrific. And uh, I always marvel at, at the way that guys come back from surgeries. He's, he had this very serious knee injury. Should have slowed him down. Hadn't slowed him down a bit. And now you're going to have uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., who is tremendous right now. Big receiver, really tough to deal with. And uh, I, I have real concerns about that uh, going into this game. Uh, one of the, We're going to do Ravens preview coming up at 1030. But I want to play this. This was, uh, this was fun the other day. If, if you're watching the Cowboys and the Ravens on Sunday, uh, Tom Brady, who uh, finally will have to do a game this week that doesn't involve the Cowboys. I think he's doing the Eagles game. Um, he, he had done three straight Cowboy games, and this was the one Ravens game that he did. But he used the term to describe Lamar Jackson as the eraser because he can make up for mistakes that happen. And on Sunday, he was the closer. I mean, they almost blew another. They were up 28-6 to in this game. They wind up winning 28-26. But late in the game, when they had to make a play, uh, Lamar had a big run to pick up a first down and, and put the game out of reach. But earlier in the game, uh, because of the mistakes that they were making on offense and the fact that uh, Lamar was able to make up for those mistakes, Brady labeled him with the nickname The Eraser, which Lamar is uh, happy to embrace. That's the GOAT, man. That's the, the only guy in the league with seven Super Bowls. Well, not in the league, but like former player, one of the greatest quarterbacks ever to play the game with seven Super Bowls. And for him to give me a nickname, The Eraser, and how he uh, – uh, but judge my game is it's just dope. It's dope for me to hear. Yeah, the uh, the last time I heard the nickname Eraser it was Marvin Webster, who was a center who played in the 70s. Played on that Sonics team that first lost to the Bullets in 78 and beat them again in uh, in the following year, 1979. I think he went to Morgan State. I think he's local. Uh, but they called him the Eraser because he was so good at blocking shots. The Eraser, in this case, is used in a different way. It's more, you know, like you make a mistake on your paper and you, and you kind of – uh, rub it out. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, Lamar Lamar has been really good. Uh, Lamar just needs to hang on to the ball a little bit more. But uh, he he has he, he continues at this stage of his career to, to run as much as he does. I think you hold your breath every time. But he's also, I guess, become a smarter runner. And uh, we're going to see a real, you know, I'll, I'll do a little preview coming up uh, the last time. The review between the, the Bills and the Ravens was two years ago. They played at M&T Bank Stadium, and the Bills won. But it was like football in college back in the 70s because both uh, Lamar Jackson and, uh, and uh, Josh, Josh Allen ran for over 70 yards apiece. <laughs> so you just don't see that between two quarterbacks. I don't think you're going to see that on Sunday night, but uh, that's what they did two years ago. The uh, the Forty ers are still waiting on uh, Christian McCaffrey, and this is this is a very interesting thing for them because uh, he's got an Achilles problem, and we've seen this happen before. Guys come in with sore calves, sore Achilles, and it leads to a tear. They don't want it to do that. So McCaffrey has gone to see a specialist in Germany about this Achilles tendonitis. And yesterday, Kyle Shanahan on a radio show said, I, I think we'll get a better idea over the next couple of weeks. The whole point of putting him on, on IR is to guarantee that we couldn't do anything for at least four weeks. And two weeks into it, the whole point was just to rest him for two weeks and not do that. Now with a minimum of two weeks left on injured reserve, the 49ers will have McCaffrey hit the ground running on his rehab work. Um, most people have reacted with alarm about hearing that he went to Germany. Shanahan says Christian's just seeing every specialist he can, doing all the little stuff that Christian does more than anybody I've been around. He is of a full-time commitment to everyone for his body year-round, so he's been doing that stuff while not pushing it hard in rehab, and now we'll probably turn it up here in the next couple of weeks. I know he still has like two more weeks before he can have an option to play him, and we'll start testing it out sooner than that. If, if in fact, the Achilles situation clears up, this actually could be a plus for the 49ers because you're going to have a less beat-up player once you get to the real late stages of the season, and he's had a history of injuries. He's remained fairly healthy since he came to the 49ers. When he was in Carolina, he was always hurt. When he plays, he's tremendous, and he fits right in into the modern 
way the, the game of football is is played these days as a, both a receiver and as a runner. Uh, but, again, the health issue is a problem. Speaking of, uh, of, the, of the running and, uh, you know, we, we, with Derrick Henry, the way he played last week against the Cowboys, if you watch Derrick Henry play right now, he, he's a guy who came along too late. You know, you hear about players who were born too soon. He's a guy who was born too late. I watch him play, and and I am just I just marvel at uh, at the way he runs the ball relative to the way the running back position is played these days. And I don't think it's blasphemy to say that he runs in a way that Jim Brown did. Uh, Jim Brown was bigger, faster, stronger than everybody else that he played with at the time, and he would just run over people. And that stiff arm that Derrick Henry gives. It's it's remarkable. There's nobody else in the league like that. And if he were playing in the 1970s, he would be considered the best player in the league. Because but because it's a passing game now, um, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Uh, speaking of Jim Brown, I, I meant to mention this uh, the other day um, on a podcast. Bill Belichick said that uh, he uh, he felt like. The league should uh, retire number 32 for Jim Brown in the way that baseball retired 42 for Jackie Robinson. And I would say this. um, As a player, he was as great in his sport or maybe better in his sport than Jackie Robinson. Later in life, he did some great things working with gangs in Los Angeles, but his history of domestic abuse is horrible. Um, according to reports, I'm reading here from a, a website about the domestic abuse. According to reports, Brown was 29 when he beat up and raped an 18 year old woman in his hotel room on July 24th, 1965, a jury found him not guilty of assault and battery. This was the pre OJ time in 1968. Brown was charged with assault with an intent to commit murder after model Eva Bon Chin was found underneath the balcony of his second floor apartment. Used to hear that all the time, uh, that he threw his girlfriend off his uh, balcony. The charge was later dismissed after Bon Chin refused to name Brown as her assailant. However, the actor had to pay a $300 fine for striking a deputy sheriff during the same incident. In 1969, Brown was accused of assault and battery charges stemming from a traffic incident where he was found not guilty and the charges were dropped. In 78, he was sentenced to one day in prison for beating and choking his golfing partner, Frank Snow. The Hollywood star was also fined $500 and given two years probation. In 1985, Brown was charged with rape and assault of a 33-year-old woman in his home. However, the judge later dismissed the charges based on inconsistent testimony against the player. In August of 1986, Brown was charged for assaulting his then-girlfriend, Deborah Clark. The charges, however, were dropped after Clark refused to prosecute. On June 15, 1999, Brown was arrested after a major dispute with his girlfriend, Monique Gunther Brown. The footballer was charged with making terrorist threats towards his wife while also threatening to kill her. He was later found guilty of vandalism for smashing his car with a shovel during the incident, fined $1,800, sentenced to three years probation after one year of domestic violence counseling and 400 hours of community service, which he did not want to do. So he went to jail for that, uh, served some time in jail under four months, just under four months, and then was released. So he died a while back. His football talent, you can't argue with it. If, if he's not the greatest football player who ever played, he's in the discussion for that. Some say it's Jerry Rice with the seven Super Bowls. Maybe it's, maybe it's Brady. But those things are all there. Those things happened. And in the pre-OJ world, that's what the police used to do. The, and, and, and courts, the same thing, that those kind of things would get dismissed. Are you telling me in the age that we live in now, that you would want to retire a number for somebody who's got that on his record, all those things. No, I, I really, I really don't think that's a good idea. And I've really never been a fan of, of retiring these numbers, period. Jackie Robinson. Yes, you could, you could make a case for that and a strong case because Jackie Robinson was not just important to the sport. He was important to the culture, maybe the most significant cultural athlete that ever lived. I put Ali a close second. 
Jim Brown, yes, his work with the gangs was tremendous at the end of his life. Um, in many ways, he was a trailblazer for African-American athletes. He did the first uh, mixed race scene in uh, 1,000 Rifles with Raquel Welch, uh, a love scene. Those, okay, in, in some things, but no, there, there's no getting around that, and that's why, that's why I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I wouldn't have even re- retired Wayne Gretzky's 99. Maybe He's the greatest hockey player who ever lived, but I don't think that's in, in the right spirit of what, what should happen here, but certainly not Jim Brown with all those things. And I think that's a misguided thought on the part of Bill Belichick. If you're going to celebrate somebody for his life and what he did, yes, there are things in his life that should be celebrated, including the work with gangs, including the fact that he was an incredible football player. And, and some even say the greatest athlete who ever lived because he's regarded as by many as the greatest lacrosse player whoever lived, though the game was a little bit different at that time as he could cradle it against his chest and basically run over people. You can't do that now. But uh, I, 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 I have an issue with, uh, with Bill Belichick on that, and, uh, and, and I, if he's going to have a campaign for that, I would, I would throw up the same thing that I just read from the website there about the history that he had. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I reminded of that because I meant to get that – to that for the last couple of days and uh you you just in this day and age where domestic violence is is finally being recognized and to think that all those things happened to him over the course of like a 25 year 30 period 30 year period um that's that's something that to me would automatically disqualify him from uh consideration to retire number 32 plus 32 is a cool number you know, who wouldn't want to wear 32, 42 baseball? That's not necessarily a number. In fact, you know, when I think of running backs, that's what you think of 32, OJ Simpson, Jim Brown, you know, others have worn it over the years and uh, kind of a kind of a stud running back number. All right. Coming up, we got Ravens preview. Uh, we will talk to Jonas Schaefer of the Baltimore Banner. Also what Jim John Harbaugh said about the Sunday matchup with Buffalo, Kyle Van Noy and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland show ESPN 630.